I think it's it's almost synonym, synonymous to entrepreneurship. So what is uh, marketing in your perspective? Oh, <clears throat> I think if I was making a list of words, entrepreneurship wouldn't be on it. Um, oh. marketing, marketing is what we do when we want to change the culture, when we want to change behavior, when we want uh, things to be different. So politicians market, uh, people who try to get you to take your medicine market, mm -hmm. uh, parents market all the time, teachers market. Marketing is the work of telling a story that's true to someone specific to help them see the world differently and take a different action. Because if change doesn't happen, then there's no marketing. Because the only purpose of marketing is to make a change. And marketing used to be this expensive thing you needed advertising to do. Mm -hmm. But that hasn't been true in a long time. Marketing is now the generous act of leading people to get them to make things better. So marketing in a nutshell is the generous act to leave people better. Yeah, because otherwise you're just a jerk. You're either stealing people's time or you're making their life worse. So the good kind of marketing, the marketing we're here to talk about, is the opposite of that. Mm. So how do I begin to market my product, my service, myself as a general soul, as a general person of product that people will love to have? Well, <clears throat> we begin with two things. First of all, you need to know who it's for. Specifically, right. it's not for everyone. And then the second thing is you have to be really clear about what it's for. What is the change you seek to make? If you are specific about that, you will make a product or service that can make that change. So now if you know who it's for and what's it for, the marketing gets a lot more straightforward than if in, you do the opposite, which is what most people do, which is you think it's for everyone. So then you make average stuff for average people and then you yell about it and that doesn't work. So that calls to mind that you need a target audience, a specific product so that you can meet their specific needs uh, to begin with that if I'm, um, developing a new uh, a book, it shouldn't be this book is all the art of marketing is for everyone. But who are my audience and how would they love to receive this content? Right. Would they miss you if, they, if you were gone? And by starting with the minimum viable audience, the smallest group of people you can imagine serving, you can be specific. And if you are specific, mm -hmm. you could create something worthwhile. If you create something worthwhile, then it's not that hard to sell it because it's worthwhile. The question why me ask is how will I know whether this product is worthwhile? How will I know why, how Apple knew, knew then that the iPhone will be accepted and adaptable by the millennials? How? Well, we've been talking for four minutes and finally you brought up Apple four whole minutes into the conversation. That <laughs> yeah. always happens with marketing conversations. So let's understand something. All right. Uh, Steve Jobs had no clue that the iPhone was gonna become the single most successful consumer product in the history of the world. None. There weren't any apps when it launched and it was positioned as an iPod that could also make phone calls. That's all it was. So mm -hmm. it was an accident. Most home runs are accidents. When they made it, they just knew there were going to be 100,000 or a million people who wanted to combine their phone and their iPod. That was what it was for. It was very specifically for that. And only after they got traction were they able to bring in the other things that ended up changing the world. So they were just trying to combine an iPad with a phone and um, magically something else happened. Yeah, and you know, lots of world-changing things turned out that way. I would say that rock and roll turned out that way or um, other forms of music. I would say that uh, we see side effects when we change the big culture. But let's be clear, the people who are listening to this today, mm. the chances that you're going to change everyone are zero. So don't yeah, try, right. right? I am way more interested in somebody who has a practice that's going to change the lives of 50 people or 100 people that 
if you're a podcaster, you can get 5,000 people to change their life because of your podcast. That's a home run. So let's be really specific and not try to be Apple because Apple is the weird exception. Now the challenge comes in here that when people are looking at uh, reaching out, marketing their products and services in, in terms of minimum viable audience or people, uh, why may I ask, okay, how, then how do I make money out of it if my audience is that small? Yeah, do, you know what? People who are beloved by a small audience never ask me how to solve their problem. It's the people who are beloved by no one who have a problem. Mm. That being beloved is a very special place to be. And it's really, really rare, right? That, you know, the, the place down the street goes out of business. Someone takes their place. No big deal. It's yeah. no big deal. That's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is what would it mean to be that uniquely special entity that connects to people at a really molecular level, begin there, begin by being really special, and then you can add more people. That second part's not as hard as the first part. So begin with the very few, very, the very core who love the things you want. And I, I, I think, I believe that that leads to word of mouth marketing. Then once the core audience love the product, then it leads to uh, it's uh, replicated in some ways, some of my people spreading the word. Exactly. So let's be clear. Social media isn't the way you become popular. It's after <laughs> you are doing something important, people talk about you in social media. It's a symptom. It's not a tactic. <laughs> so the, the question I, I, I got here is like, does that, if you're a CEO of a company, company X, and the company has its own capabilities, expertise, and all that, you as a CEO, the company too is, has unique skill and competence. How do you effectively distinguish your CEO brand from that of your organization? Why would you want to do that? Uh, perhaps the person wants to distinguish himself as a specific brand, brand, a personal brand, and my company is in different products and services, and I'm into maybe speaking, motivation or something, but my company produce some other products. How do I distinguish this, these two brands and make sure they stand on their own? You mean sort of like Howard Schultz and Starbucks? Yes, exactly. Well, you know, so we live in this era of the celebrity CEO, this <laughs> era where everyone is a celebrity. Yeah. And I think it's a more interesting question to say, why do you want to do that? That um, it's an interesting shortcut for Richard Branson to say, I am the face of Virgin, because it's cheaper for Richard Branson to be famous than it is for Virgin to be famous. Richard Branson can go do stunts and be crazy out there. And yeah. that, the argument is that some of that rubs off on okay. Virgin's brand, right? But that's really rare. I don't <laughs> think many people go to Starbucks because of Howard Schultz. Now I know people don't go to Howard Starbucks. <laughs> But um, I think that that shortcut, uh, which I have taken with work I have done to be the face of a brand, yeah. is a shortcut that isn't necessarily the best route to doing the work you care about. Because here's the thing, your customers never buy from you because they care about you. They buy from you because they care about themselves. Mm -hmm. And so if Jennifer Aniston is wearing Uggs, and you wear Uggs, you're not wearing Uggs because you like Jennifer Aniston. You're wearing Uggs because you think you will look better in your friend's eyes because you are doing something Jennifer Aniston is doing. It's for you that you're doing it, and it has to do with the celebrity, but it's not because of the celebrity, the celebrity. because of our narrative. Oh, okay. So though it, it, it moves an inch, but people do things for their own reasons and for themselves. That my C said in this colored uh, spectacle glasses, I love said, I want to get colored, but I'm doing that for me, not because of- Exactly, exactly. So there's a big difference between tell the others and find the others. Tell the others says, I need your support. Please tell everyone else. Mm. No one cares. If it's, there are other people like you who are supporting me, 
let's spread the word because it will make you look smart. That is something people care about. Oh. The, the other thing is that looking at what you call celebrity brands or CEO brands or, or, or personal brands, how do they manage, uh, the, how do you think they should manage their, their brands in terms of crisis? A case in reference, let's look at Tiger Woods. He yeah. suffered so many things. How do you, in, in, in those damaging moments, able to keep your brand intact? Okay, so what is a brand? A brand is a shorthand. It's a promise that you make about what to expect next. Mm -hmm. So if I'm used to buying walnuts from a company and the walnuts always taste a certain way and they always cost about the same and I can always get them the same way, that's their brand. Not their logo, but their promise, right? Yeah. So Tiger Woods, who cares if he wins a tournament? You're not buying the tournament. You're buying what does it mean to be seen as a fan of Tiger Woods? Does it make me look good in front of my colleagues? Does it make me look good when I look in the mirror if I say I am aligned with Tiger Woods, right? That's the promise. And for a brand that's worth hundreds of millions of dollars, he did a lot of really stupid things. He did a lot of <laughs> stupid things as a human, but also as a brand marketer because he broke the promise over and over again. Because now if you show up in a certain setting with tiger stuff on, people don't look at you with respect. They look at you like you're clueless. So that's the damage to the brand. And the question then is, what does he do if he wants to regain it? Well, yeah. one arc, one story to live, and this is what celebrities do is they live a story, is if he came back and won the Masters, his brand would be better than ever. Because what it would mean to where his brand is, I'm the kind of person that supports someone who falls down, gets up, dusts himself off, and then wins. Right? Yeah. But if you don't do the last part, now the brand is, I support someone who falls down, screws up, and never wins again. That's a hard brand for me to wear. So his challenge going forward as a brand manager, mm. other than getting his life in order, is what story do you want people to tell themselves when they think about you? Mm. Right? Yeah. So if I were running the brand Tiger Woods, and had had those stumbles, I don't think my strategy at the age of 40, whatever, would have been to have back surgery and trying to win a golf tournament because mm -hmm. it's too long a road. It's not going to work. <laughs> I think my strategy would have been tell the truth, acknowledge that you screwed up and say, now I'm devoting the rest of my time to these schools, to training these children, to writing this injustice. And I'm not, you're not going to see me on a golf course again, except when I'm out there to raise money. Because what it means to wear my brand is to acknowledge that we grow up and I'm growing up. And so if you want to support me on this journey to create justice, that's what this brand stands for now. I think he could have pulled that off better than he could have pulled off the I'm a golfer. So at, at this moment, I think it's still workable if you decide to go by this route and go back and said, okay, I messed up. I did all this. I've come back to win a championship. But I think I want to refocus and regroup and promise you something better, which I'm going to stick to it. Right. I mean, because what Tiger's brand has always stood for is nobody sticks to it more than him. Than him. Right? That when he, took, when he started playing, John Daly was the competition. John Daly, who could drink a six-pack before the third hole right? John Daly was an amateur. Tiger Woods was a professional. So what it meant was if you're the kind of person who believes that strength training and practice and coaching can pay off, wear my emblem because that's what mm -hmm. I stand for, mm -hmm. right? It's going to be really hard for him to double down on that. Mm. So then um, he might need to look at some other ways. So that, uh, the, the damage has already been caused, I see. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think the reason this is worth talking about is not because any of us are Tiger Woods. Yeah. The reason it's worth talking about is that each of us makes promises. We make promises to our boss, to our spouse, to the people in our lives. It's hard to keep that promise every day, right? So yeah. what are you going to do when the promise isn't kept? Broken. How are you going to recover? And 
the way we recover from a broken promise fuels the story that the brand has going forward. So as we can you throw in some ways we can really recover from, I mean, our broken promises as brands and businesses? Uh, because a lot of brands do, do, do that. How do we recover and stay strong and get our audience or market still buying to our services? Right. So here's what happens if you stay at a Marriott hotel. If you stay at a Marriott hotel and you order something for room service and it screws up, they will uh, wait until you complain. And then after you complain, they'll give you a refund for what you just spent. That means the promise of Marriott, which they are consistent to keeping is we don't care. And if you bother us enough, we'll give you some money. That's totally different than what they could do. Here's what they could do. One, when they pick up the food, if you haven't eaten the food, they could reach out to you and find out why Mm. they could affirmatively try to solve the problem. The way that they do it at, um, I think it's the Ritz, is every person who works there has $250 to solve a problem on the spot. On the spot. So it's not the manager, it's the chambermaid who says, I see that blah, blah, blah. Here, the room's on us tonight, right? So that's number one, empower human beings. Mm -hmm. But the other thing that Marriott could do is they could say, wait a minute. We have all this data on people. Seth has been staying here for 20 years. He always comes with big conferences. So he's a valuable customer. And we're about to lose him because we didn't deliver breakfast. So no, we're not going to give him back breakfast. We're going to work very hard to think about what he really likes. Right? So we know he's leaving the hotel tomorrow at noon to go to the airport. We know that because... We have the data. So when the car comes to pick them up in the car, we're going to have a whole little buffet for him with a note from the manager saying, look, we're really sorry. Breakfast yesterday was terrible. Here's what, you know, and here's a, a kind bar into this and to this and this, because we know all this about you. You're our friend. Thank you for being here. So now the whole way home to the airport, I'm thinking, wow, wow. those guys really care about me. Yeah. It's not that hard. It just means you have to care. And the problem that so many brands have is they think they're too big to care. Brands, you are not too big to care. So so it it even shows that it doesn't even cost much to pay attention to care about your clients and customers uh, by offering the promise because these are the little things that that, that catches uh, the attention and touch their hearts. Right. Exactly, because we're humans. Then why then do we have brands uh, going to a lot of uh, brand advertising, a lot of noise in social media, media, flying just to get our attention, but deliver low on their promise? Because think about how the organization is structured, right? <laughs> that if you're in the department that buys advertising, you have a pile of money, you have to spend <laughs> it today, and you don't want to be on the hook for caring. You just want to run a Super Bowl commercial. So that's what you do. That mm. if you're the CFO and you're looking at the budget for the call center, you think you can get a raise by saying, let's have everyone in the call center spend 15 seconds less on the phone. Because if everyone spends 15 seconds less on each call, we'll save $20,000. Yeah. Right? There's nobody in the organization that's saying, wait a minute. Let's have everyone in the call center spend an extra minute on the phone. Because in that last minute, when we're just joking around with the customer, asking them if we want to, you know, what, what we think is going to happen in the baseball game, that minute is priceless. But there's nobody whose job it is to spend that money. So do you think that, or do you see yourself that you've reached the iconic stage of personal brand? As a person that set has become an icon in brand that we look up to set for so many things in terms of digital marketing, technology marketing, that your brand is, is I mean, is the go-to brand. You, you, your brand stick in the hearts of people. Yeah, only for a very small number of people, which is fine with me. Fine with me. 99 <laughs> of the people on earth have no idea who I am. That is fine. That is my goal. I think you've said this a number of times in a number of interviews that you you think uh, that you only influence a percentage of the masses. 
It's true. It's easy to show. Mm-hmm. Right? Go, you know about Google Trend Search, right? Yeah, yeah. So go do a Google Trend Search on me and then type in anybody else who's actually famous. And you will see that like it goes like this. Because I'm not famous. I'm totally happy not being famous. Thank you very much. So let's look at the balance. Somebody can be famous but not impacting people. But you might not be that famous, but your impact might be very huge. That's what I'm trying to do. Okay, so you're not seeking to be popular or famous by seeking to make more impact. Because someone like you is going to talk to someone who never heard of me and teach them something. That's my goal, is for the people who learn directly from me to teach the others. That's what I'm trying to do. And that's what I'm doing. Thank you, sir. But Seth, uh, you've been in the book industry for all these uh, years. Yeah. Some, someone is asking that, what is the impact of having your book translated into various languages? That's a um, great question. No one has ever asked me that question before. There's the Spanish edition of This Is Marketing sitting right over there. So I will tell you that for my ego, it's fantastic because I don't even speak Spanish or there it is in you know, that language and this language and that language. I've been 37 languages now. I think that's fantastic. It, um, <clears throat> in terms of feedback, I almost never hear from people in other countries mm. who have read it in another language because they understand that I don't speak their language. <clears throat> and one way they know that, sorry for the coughing, one way they know that is the translations aren't always great. Some of them are good and mm. some of them aren't as good. And it makes me feel bad if I hear from someone that the translation was bad, but I don't know how to make the translation better. So I'm doing my best when someone asks. But uh, what's really fascinating is if I show up in Turkey or if I show up in Estonia and someone who's read it in the other language tells me that it has changed their, the arc of their work, that makes it totally worth it. Totally worth it. So I think all your contributions has always been in sync in terms of driving home the message that if it's just one person who benefited from all these products and services, that's fine by me. Because you believe that one soul can still uh, affect other people to affect a large number of people. Exactly. And why isn't that true for everybody, right? That if each one of us could just turn on a light, could just inspire one other person, Mm -hmm. then we'd end up with everyone. I said, somebody wanted to know that he's published books in, he knew the audience, target market and all that. But this time the book is not selling. What should he do? Okay. So there is no connection between whether a book is good and whether it sells. Mm -hmm. There is a connection between whether a book is well published and whether it sells. And so you got to begin by not beating yourself up about whether your book is good or not. So now we have to say, what does it mean for a book to be Be well published? Mm -hmm. And what it means is that other people are saying to their friends, you have to go buy this book. If that is happening, your book will be selling. If it's not happening, it won't. So here's the question. If your book reached a thousand people, Why aren't they telling anyone? Mm -hmm. And you need to find out so that your next book won't have that problem. So you can write a book that is more likely to spread because you can write it so that it will spread. So don't blame the publisher. Understand it's the book's job to get its readers to tell the others. So if the book is not giving that effect it means um now we, we are up whether it's a good book or not it means that the book is wasn't able to communicate clearly to its audience the thousand or the five hundred people the book reached close that's not, not what i'm saying though lots of books people read and it changes them but they don't tell anyone no, else mm. so the job the book has two jobs the book's job is to educate and entertain the reader but the book is also charged with putting a bug in the reader's head that cannot get out until you tell someone else that you have it. It's like 
the cold I have right now. How did I get this cold? I didn't get it from the person who invented the cold. I got this cold from someone who got the cold, who got the cold, from someone who got the cold, and on and on and on. So that's what we're trying to build, is a virus inside the words so that you have to tell the others, right? The number one best-selling book in history is the Bible. That's because built into the Bible is the rule that the first thing you do when you meet someone else is tell them to go read the Bible. So then <coughs> we see that every book needs to have that hook effect that once you read, it should compel you to tell a third person that this is something you also need. Until that hook is done, your book is not completed. Well, your book won't sell. That doesn't sell. mean your book isn't good. It doesn't mean your book isn't finished. You might not want to write a book that's going to sell. But if you want to write a book that's going to sell, that has to be part of it. How do you get a hook? Well, it ranges from Michelle Obama's book to yeah. Catcher in the Rye. So what does Catcher in the Rye have to do with Michelle Obama? Oh. Nothing. Except they're for people. And so different books will touch different people in different ways for different reasons. You just got to start with that. There's no formula. There's no formula. I just Sorry. begin. Sorry. No <laughs> the, 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 there are no shortcuts. You, you know, the good news about the book business is there's no penalty for trying. Mm -hmm. And so you should try. And you, as you try, you will learn. So, you know, I did 120 books as a book packager. I invented more than a thousand books as a book packager. Only a couple became bestsellers. So I learned. And over time, you get better at figuring out how to talk to people in a way that will spread. Seth, I always have to deal with this in my book publishing workshop. A lot of a number of authors will come to me that have written a book. The book or the focus of the book is mostly want to make a sale from their books. And I keep telling them that you don't write a book to make money. Look for other avenues to generate money. And most of them still don't get it. Right. I don't know how you're going to address this. Well, <clears throat> a lot of times struggling entrepreneurs will do everything to make money. Mm -hmm. Every single thing. They're hustling, hustling, hustling. That's why they don't make money because no one trusts them. What if they said instead, I'm going to do nothing to make money. Everything I'm going to do is to make trust. Trust. Because if you make trust, the money will take care of itself. If you make trust, the money will take care of itself. So you should focus on building trust with people. Right. And the trust can generate into income and other sorts of revenue. Maybe, but my Perhaps. point is not that you should give things away that, for free? that other people charge for. That doesn't build trust. That just builds oh. trial, right? Trust is, I took a risk, I gave you a chance, and you kept your promise. That is what trust looks like. Mm. So if you write a book, whether the book costs nothing or $500, does it keep its promise? The problem with people who write books trying to sell something is that the book promised to do one thing and it did something else instead. This is marketing. You can't be seen until you learn to see. Yes. Why can't we be seen until we learn to see? I'm loud that people want to be loud on social media. It's the issue of the season. Right. But they seem not to get the traction they need. Is it they are refusing to see? Right. So what does it mean to see? It means to have empathy. It means to realize mm. no one cares about you and your opinion. They care about themselves and their own opinion. If you can't see them for who they are, for who, where their fears and desires and dreams are, they will ignore you because they only want to hang out with people who see them. And so being seen is an unlimited need that people you serve have. And if you can see them and understand them, then you can tell them a story that they want to hear and they are more likely to engage with you. So then do you suggest that uh, every entrepreneur or brand or individual should, should be more focused on emotional intelligence, to have empathy, uh, building in their products and their services so they can understand people better to help meet their needs. Yeah, that's beautifully said. And the second half of it is for only some people. Be very specific. 
because you cannot be empath empathic to everyone. Mm, mm. Right? <laughs> you cannot, That's challenging. Right? You cannot see everyone, understand everyone. So pick who you're going to see, pick who you're going to understand and do that. So you need to pick your audience and meet their needs. If it blows up, fine. If not, just keep on um, pushing the things that you need. Right, Why do because generosity is scarce and generosity scales. Generosity is scarce and it scales as well. Yeah. So then those who are generous get to have their brands scaling. Right. So generous, again, doesn't mean you gave it away for free. It means you showed up with emotional labor to make things better. And that can be expressed in many, many ways. ways. Right. So when you think about the Macintosh, when it first came out, mm -hmm. it was generous in that it was better designed than it needed to be. You got all that other interaction as a bonus because it was a computer mm. plus all this generous thought and design went into it. So that's what people talked about. They didn't say, oh, a computer. No one needed to talk about a computer. They talked about the surprising generosity of it. Like the free gift inside. You give them something more than they could have. <laughs> exactly. So in your concluding remarks, what would be your top three advice to brands out there regarding marketing? Top three, one, uh, stop acting like a company and start acting like a person. How? By caring, by showing up with your version of the truth and being consistent and personal about what you believe. Number two is um, be generously persistent, meaning when there's a way you can make things better, don't show up once with it. Show up and show up and show up and show up and show up with it. And number three is earn permission. The privilege of talking to people who want to hear from you. Own that asset. Don't give it to Facebook. Don't give it to the phone company. You own the connection directly with the people you seek to serve. If you do those three things, things get better. Wow. Amazing. So what has been your greatest pain all these years? Writing books, doing workshops, uh, master classes. But what has been your greatest pain? And to solve, to meet that need, greatest pain. My greatest pain? Yeah. I am super lucky. There are people who live with pain every day. I just get a cold every two months. Um, I would say that my frustration mm -hmm. is that people think that being selfish is a good thing. And mm -hmm. when I am able to show them how powerful generosity can be, it's thrilling. Oh, seems to have a kind, soft heart for people. And I think that is the heart of marketing. I think it works. I think it works. Thank you for doing this podcast. We need leaders like you. I really appreciate it. Thank you. It's a pleasure. I treasure. Okay.